Well, hello boys and girls. Uh, today's video is all about creating uh, laser etched nameplates. And at this point I'm going to stop and say that for this to work you need to have access to a, a DIY powder coating setup and also a laser engraver. So if you don't have either of those two things then you won't be able to make this process work in quite the same way as what I'm doing here. This um, this little logo here was uh, part of a restoration project that I'm doing. It belonged to a, an old uh, laundry trolley that belonged to my grandmother. And it was made by UMI, which was United Metal Industries, and they were a uh, metal fabricator based in Brisbane, Australia, back in the 1930s. And uh, this artwork was originally either screen printed or uh, printed on the surface of an aluminium tray probably using something like a gelatin transfer mold which was a common way of adding painted artwork to metal parts. Uh, when I did the restoration on the aluminium tray the original logo was badly degraded and I ended up just uh, scrubbing it off with um, a scotch Brite pad but before I did that I photographed the artwork and I digitized that using Corel Draw to create a vector graphic and from the vector I produced a bitmap image that the laser engraver can work with. The material comes out of the laser engraver looking like that. So you can see here that some of the powder coat hasn't been fully removed by the etching process and there are remnants down the side here. And you always end up with a slight sheen of powder coat on the surface of the aluminium which needs to be removed and I do that using an etching solution of caustic soda or lye and it will uh, remove that slight haze that's present on the surface of the material and there are some areas like right at the top here where I can still see some of the powder coat where it should have been removed completely by the, the laser engraver. I've got to make a decision whether I keep that one or whether I, I use another one that I've already made. I may keep this one because the lettering is uh, pretty good on this one. Sometimes the laser engraver needs to be run over that surface twice uh, to remove more of the powder coat and that in turn makes some of these areas a bit thinner and narrower. So I think this one's good enough, I might sort of just mechanically remove some of that remaining powder coat and use this one. So this one is pretty much ready to go. I'll drill a pair of holes at the corners I'm going to attach this to the original tray using hollow rivets and I'll I'm proposing to do a follow-up video on making hollow rivets. Uh, I could use pop rivets, but uh, under the circumstances, that because we're going to be put putting clothing in this tray, there's a chance they're going to snag on the uh, formed end of the rivets. So I, I think the hollow rivets probably a better way of doing it. So let's have a look at the powder coating process, and then we'll have a look at the, the laser etching, and then the finishing up process. If you've uh, watched any of my videos at all, you probably realise I'm a bit of a fanboy for um, home or DIY powder coating setups. Um, this is a job that I have to do today. I'm making a seam roller, and this is just made of mild steel. It's got a couple of uh, brass bushes, silver soldered on, and this part of the seam roller is going to be exposed. If you make any thing like this out of steel it's inevitably going to corrode you're going to get rust it's going to look terrible I could paint it uh, but as you probably realize painting is really only a temporary solution uh, the sort of paints that most DIYers can get hold of are usually enamels or acrylics and you've only got to scuff them against something and that paint's going to come off and it's going to corrode so powder coating is allowing me to make tools that look you know reasonably professional in this case, uh, this is where the roller is going to go. So I've just got a couple of um, ball bearings set in a piece of polyethylene uh, to use as the roller. Uh, I'll put a uh, circlet on the end of the axle. And I've already made a timber handle. And this tool is going to last because this steel is going to end up corroding. And it all, when, when you are powder coating, this always comes out glossy. It, the coating is quite thick. It's chip resistant, scuff resistant. And of course, if the steel was clean when you started, it's not going to corrode underneath that coating easily. So, uh, in terms of 
you know, finishing this job, I was able to get this done in one day. Uh, if I was painting this, I'd have to prep it, I'd have to undercoat it, I'd have to put a top coat on, I'd need to probably do this over a period of days. Uh, with the powder coating, it can all be done literally in, in 20 minutes and it's done. So, my handle goes on like so, and I've got a nut and a washer to finish it off. So, buying a DIY powder coating tool was probably the best investment I've made in my workshop for a long time. Um, it really does belong in, in most amateur workshops. They're, they are a bit expensive to purchase. There you go. Seam roller looks good and it's going to last. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's worth the investment. The aluminium stock that I'm using here is 0.8 of a millimetre thick. It was cleaned just with steel wool and some solvent. In my case I use methylated spirits. It's uh, given one coat of super wet black gloss powder coat and it's baked in a, a domestic oven at 200 degrees C for about 15 minutes. The powder coating process is very quick, very simple and it leaves you with a beautiful glossy coating and once it's etched in the laser engraver it creates very crisp clear outlines. My laser uses a 50 watt CO2 tube and here I'm just holding the blank down with a piece of steel plate with a couple of rare earth magnets. This is just to ensure that it doesn't rock and roll while the laser head moves backwards and forwards and scans across the surface of the material. The scan method I'm using is 0 0.05 per millimetre step over and I was running this at about 80% power and about 300 millimetres per minute. The first pass will expose the artwork and then this second pass is just to burn off any remaining powder coat that might still be on that surface. After the um, laser etching process, there's a very fine coating of um, powder coat still left on that aluminium surface there. There's one that's finished, and you see that this one is slightly more dull and it's got a slight grey cast to it. So the, the final step uh, before we trim the outside is to clean off this surface here, and I'm using caustic soda or sodium hydroxide or lye, and um, it's just a case of dipping this in the solution. And then you just got to do a bit of a, a check every now and then just to see how that's going. Uh, what you don't want to do is to undercut the uh, powder coat and lose all that fine detail. So if I leave that in there for about uh, five minutes, I'll take it out, give it a light scrub with a, a fine brush like a toothbrush, uh, check the surface, put it back and uh, just keep doing that until I think the surface is clean. So as you can see this surface now has got a fine sheen of bubbles all over it which means that the etching solution has got through to the base metal and I'm just going to take this out and rinse it and give it a, a light scrub, put it back, I might have to do that two or three times. So when I scrub that now with the toothbrush you'll see sometimes the different appearance as you scrub over it. If you look really closely, uh, get a magnifying glass 
have a good close look you may be able to see some remnants of the, the powder coat but I reckon that's pretty good. I, I don't want to over etch it because it does affect the appearance of the aluminium it starts to go really dull and grey and coarse. So I reckon that's okay. I'll give it one more go. After you have scrubbed that with a toothbrush, put it back, you will see the uh, etching becomes much more aggressive because uh, we've basically cleaned the surface, exposed all of the aluminium and allowed the etching solution to get at it. And it might take another three or four minutes and then I'll be done. Well, I just gave that a rinse and a final scrub. I've got a very fine uh, scouring pad and I used a little bit of um, Ajax, just some bathroom cleaner and went over that. And I'm happy with that. That's got good definition. The background's clean. I'll just uh, demonstrate how this one can be finished. The next step is to remove the bulk of the waste material and this can be done with a pair of straight snips. And uh, one tip if you're doing this is to um, go around first and remove a fair amount of the material just with straight cuts. The thing we want to avoid here is to um, distort the base metal and if you try and follow a curved line with a pair of straight snips you're really sort of levering the waste out of the way and that levering process can distort the flat sheet. So um, I want to leave as you can see with this one, I want to leave probably about a millimeter uh, boundary all the way around the part. So I'm just going to progressively cut more and more of this off with straight cuts. And then when I'm close, I'm going to follow around with a curved cut. But the remaining material is going to come off with a file. So I'm just sort of eyeballing this Oh, well, that's not perfect, but I'm going to get it to look like that just by filing. So the process to finish this now is just to go around and file the edge to remove the, the last of the excess material. And what I don't want to do here is put this in a metal vise and run the risk of damaging the, the surface or scuffing the, the powder coat. So I'm just going to hold this down to a wooden block. I'm just going to use an ordinary flat file to go around and trim that excess. One of the things about doing this, you've got to hold a file one-handed and a trick that I learned years ago when I was teaching students was um, to get them to hold the file short, just lay it on the palm of your hand, wrap your fingers around the underside of the file, put your index finger down the back of the file and have the handle up underneath your forearm and that locks the file in your grip and allows you to use it one-handed with a fair degree of accuracy. If you hold it back here You've got a lot of overhang um, and it's very hard to keep the, the pressure on the, the teeth of the file to make it cut. So I'm just going to hold this down, work my way around, just slowly take off the excess. Okay, so that's close to where I want it. Um, I'm just eyeballing this edge as I go around. Uh, this is going to be fitted against another piece of aluminium of around about the same age. So if, um, if I misjudge the width of that outer edge there, it's not really going to show that badly. So 
I'll probably just give that a light sand with a sanding block to remove the burrs and uh, drill some fixing holes and then we're going to rip that onto the tray. Alright, so there's, there's two. You can if you want to have these in a situation where they're more decorative, this is more of a utilitarian approach, but if you want this to be really decorative, you can clear coat over the top of that with the uh, DIY powder coat gun, and that just adds a further protective layer to the aluminium substrate, and it also gives it a, a glossy texture. In the situation that I'm doing this in, I, I don't need that. This needs to look more like the original material. So I'm going to leave it sort of with that dull grey aluminium look. And uh, I think you'll see on the, the finished tray that that works. So as you can see, this is a, uh, a pair now ready to be fitted. I've drilled a pair of three and a half millimeter holes in the outer extremities there. And I want to hold this onto the body of the laundry trolley with rivets. and you know, the obvious solution would be to use pop rivets, but um, I think they're going to look untidy. And the formed end of the rivet is either going to be on, it on the outside, which is going to look ugly, or it's going to be on the inside. And because of the, the fact that it's holding clothing, it's going to get snagged on the end of the rivets. And oh, I don't need to be in that much trouble with my wife. So I'm going to use a type of rivet called a hollow rivet. And uh, there's nothing particularly new or exciting about these. They've been around a long time and this is one that I just did as a, a proof of concept just to see if it's going to work. So the, um, the idea is that you have a flat or a domed or a formed head on one side. On the other side it's drilled uh, to take a punch and then the hollow tubular section of the rivet is formed into a flange that pulls the two parts together. And of course these are really neat because um, the flange is held down very flat it doesn't have any sharp edges uh, very low profile and for what it's doing it's going to be fine so um, I'm going to I was going to do this as a separate video but I think I'll just forge ahead and, and show you because there's not much to it uh, the main things that you need are the punch itself and this is made from silver steel and it's just got a, um, a spigot on the end uh, which is very easily formed in the in the lathe. Uh, for the rivet material, I'm using 10 millimeter round aluminium bar stock, uh, just because I have some, and I'll need to machine a set of rivets. And they're a bit tedious, but um, and very small, of course, so it does take a while. Of course, you can make hollow rivets out of copper, brass, aluminium, any sort of soft or ductile metal. Not sure how you go with stainless or mild steel. Uh, but it's doable. Uh, you might have to um, sort of anneal the material first so it doesn't split when you form the, the tubular section of the rivet but it, it's entirely possible. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll show you how to make the, the punch first but it's, you know, it's pretty basic and uh, then I'll demonstrate uh, the fitting of the rivets to the, the name plates that I've made. So the tool I'm using to form the spigot on the punch is a just a standard high-speed steel tool. It has a fairly pronounced nose radius and that's to ensure that you get a smooth transition between the pin on the punch and the flat surface that forms the, the flange of the rivet. I'm using silver steel stock in a collet chuck. I did find that in the three-jaw chuck the material was chattering more than I liked. Uh, the collet chuck seems to do a better job of holding them to uh, steady. The process for machining the rivets was first of all to turn the head diameter. Uh, I turned down the length long enough to make one rivet at a time. After the head diameter was set, I then drilled for the diameter of the punch pin. I found that drilling the hole for the punch section first gave you a better result. Turning the tubular section of the rivet first and then drilling uh, could lead to a distortion of the barrel of the rivet, especially if you drill a bit, it's not perfectly sharp. So here you can see me center drilling. I'll follow up with a 3mm drill bit 
which was the diameter of the punch spigot or the punch pin. The drilling, I was able to turn the outside diameter of the tubular section of the rivet, which was 3.5 millimeters. So the wall thickness between the hollow center section of the rivet and the outer section or the outer diameter of the tubular part was only 0.25 millimeter thick. After turning all of the correct outer diameters of the rivet, I swapped over to a fine parting tool and I parted off a little bit over length to form the head of the rivet. And with the DRO, it's easy to do your offsets and you can replicate that on the following rivets. Here I'm just catching the, the rivet. These are quite small. Uh, plenty of times I've actually parted off a rivet have it, having it uh, fall down the tray and you never see it again. Once all the rivets were manufactured, I put them into the collet chuck one after the other. I set my uh, turning tool with a piece of feeler stock. This is 0.03 millimeter feeler stock. And I was then able to offset with the DRO to find the correct position for the flat section of the rivet head. Um, I just took very, very light cuts here. I know this seems conservative, but um, I hate working this close to a chuck just in case something goes wrong. And Following the facing process to get all the rivet heads the same thickness, I chamfered very, very lightly with a 45 degree tool. So I now have four of these hollow rivets and these are ready to fit. Uh, what I did right at the end was just simply put it on the back of the collar chuck, face off the head so they all came to a uniform thickness and then very very lightly chamfered the edge. So um, I only made four and I've got to fit four so if I screw one up I'm in trouble. So what I need to do here is just uh, work out where my centre point on the aluminium tray is going to be. So I just temporarily clamped a couple of blocks to the ends because I don't have a sharp edge that I can work from. And my dimension between these end points is 740 and uh, I've marked already a centre point at um, 370 which is halfway if my maths is any good. And uh, what I need to do then is to simply offset uh, the distance between the rivet holes <coughs> so I can locate where these pieces go. So I'll just do the maths there and see how we get on. So three and a half millimeter diameter hole, which is the diameter of the rivets that I made. I'm just going to deburr that. We'll get that first rivet in. All right, this is the tricky part. So I've got my hollow rivet sitting here on my anvil, and I was going to place the rivet through the hole, and. Plate also over the rivet, and then it's just a matter of putting the punch in the hollow stem of the rivet. So here we go, we're going to just uh, form that flange, and that's it. So there's the, the flat head of the rivet, and 
there's nothing there to catch anything. It looks fairly inconspicuous, so I'm happy with that. turned out pretty good and I'm happy with the result there and the next time I'm downstairs hanging out the washing I'm gonna have a look at that and really admire it. Oh, hang on, what am I talking about? I'm the man of the family. I'm in charge around here. What I say goes. I'm not hanging out any washing. Oh, hi dear. I was just telling everybody how much I was admiring this uh, restoration job I've done on the laundry trolley. Bye. I think I got away with that. What do you think? Oh, for God's sake.